Hello, this is Steve from Vito's Leatherworks. Today's project is this very cool World War II flight jacket. Now this is the scene as better days, unfortunately, right? But we're gonna basically disassemble the whole jacket. We're going to patch the shoulders here. We're gonna replace part of this back panel because there's no salvaging that. And we're gonna try to use some of the leather that's from the old piece to put on the shoulders here as the panels. We're going to restitch the entire jacket, clean the condition, add some color. And if you look here, there are 30 bombs, 30 insignias. Those are for the 30 missions that the pilot went on. All right, let's get started. So a little background story in regards to the owner of the flight jacket. There was an article written about him in 2006. Unfortunately, he is no longer alive, but the article goes something like this. The Thor Squadron insignia still adds a flash of color to Wilbur Bowers' worn brown World War II flight jacket. Bowers, 81, doesn't wear it today. Instead, one of his sons enjoys the leather jacket and the rich stories that go along with it. Most of those stories recall Bowers' days as a tail gunner in a B-17 Flying Fortress bomber fighting over Nazi Germany in the moments after D-Day. Bowers played end for Kittening High School before graduating in 1942 and winning a scholarship to play at, at Duquesne University. The, that lasted one season. Soon, Bowers joined the millions of Americans drafted into the Army and exchanged civilian coats for leather flight jackets and olive drab garments. He completed basic training in the Army Air, Air Corps Mechanic and Gunnery School. At age 20, the tall, slender Bowers was married to his high school sweetheart, Mary Ellen St Stebick. He thought about her at her daily prayers when he climbed into the flying fortress, Begin the Begin, named for a famous Cole Porter song. The four engine bomber bristled with 50 caliber machine guns and was laden with bombs as it roared off to Bedford, England airfield with Bowers on the bomber's first mission with the 8th Air Force. Bowers was a waste gunner for two missions. Then he volunteered to crawl into aircraft's tail for the next 28 missions so that he could fight and have hope of getting orders to go home after then magic 30 missions. It was cramped in the plane's tail section and so cold that even the fiery hot 50 caliber empty bullet casings grew cold in the seconds they took to rain down on Bowers' lap and feet. Staff Sergeant Bowers was taller than most of his crew too. That forced him to wear only his parachute harness while in the gun and, st and to tuck his safety chute away just behind where he kneeled at the gun. I made sure I could reach it, he chuckled. The leather flight jacket remained in his quarters during the flights over Germany. He climbed into the comf comfortable jacket when the bomber returned. During bombing runs, Bowers donned a special electrical suit leather flying cap and a wool clothing to survive the minus 40 degrees cold in the unheated tail section. Then all he had to do was try to avoid flak from the ground and bullets from German fighter planes. Once a bullet or piece or a piece of steel shrapnel tore through the tail just behind where he knelt. It was a big hole too, he said quietly. Bowers who years after would serve on Kittling Council and a term as mayor, shared a dangerous but essential job that the other airmen and pilots who wanted to bomb the Axis powers to submission. Begin the Begin led the 12 planes of its squadron for 30 missions. The first attack on June 11, 1944 was in support of the post D-Day push. Later, the bombers would fly five hours from England to unleash bombs on factories and railroads across Germany. On a, dress, on a Dresden firebomb raid, Bowers looked out the tail section at squadrons of bombers as far as I could see. 
I was sure glad they were ours, he said. Each mission was recorded as a red bomb painted on the left chest of his age-weathered flight jacket. The 30 red bombs are faded on Bauer's jacket, but they cannot fade from his memory. so we've got majority of the jacket apart clean thoroughly and we're gonna let it dry overnight we're gonna come back and add a little bit of color not too much we want to keep that patina still but we don't want it to be looking like dry rotted like that so we'll darken those areas up and condition the hell out of the leather in some areas, we're going to replace the panels, like the shoulder, that back piece. We're going to replace that. And a little bit of the shoulder arm. Make sure that those get done. And then we'll be back. Let's continue. All right, so what we're doing now, we're going to do some outlines on these bombs. And not really fill in the red too much, just a little bit. I think once we outline it and then condition it, it'll it'll mute the black a little bit. It won't be so in your face, let's say, for example. I think once the once it gets done, the outcome will be very nice. All right, so I have tons of leather in my shop and looking for something that would kind of, I don't know, come close to that. It's not gonna be exact. The one's, you know, so old, the other one's brand new. I came across this cushion that I made years ago. It's just a cushion. I had made it for just display when I was doing upholstery work years and years ago. Now this leather, the thickness is very close to what we have, along with the color. If you guys can tell, color is pretty close to it. 
Of course, you can't really tell in the in the in the camera there. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this apart. We're going to replace the shoulder to shoulder a panel across, put a new piece. Some of that leather that I'm going to remove from the shoulder piece or the back piece, I should say, we're going to put it across here just so we can have the same leather on the jacket. We're going to try to keep as much as we can of the original jacket but in these areas, obviously, there's no way, you know, there's no keeping that. You know, it looks like a rusted car, for Christ's sake. So, so we'll replace a little bit of that. And also, I'm going to guess to see maybe, maybe the ends of the sleeves. I might be able to do something with those also. So I think, I think we got pretty lucky with this, with this leather. Very, very close to what, what the jacket is. And once it gets done, I'll blend that in a little bit as far as tinting it, uh, roughing it up, just to kind of give it some age and we'll make it look uh, very similar to what the old leather was. All right, let's continue. Just like the old days. <laughs> it's what happens when you're recording on your own. You don't have somebody holding the camera for you to move it around. You just have to figure out where to put the tripod and and you hope that it stays there while the machine is vibrating when you're sewing the material. Let's continue. <laughs> so now comes the time to reassembly. So you've got lots of stitch holes, right? Two rows right here. And two rows underneath. So all you gotta do is match your existing hole to where it's supposed to be the first row right there and then the second row stitch right here that's when it's folded over you put a top stitch on there just got to take your time and make sure that you're stitching 
Not in the same holes, but in the same line, at least, of the original. All right, let's continue. Now the new leather is not goatskin. I don't think this is goatskin either, the original jacket. This is an oil tanned leather where you've got, where you, it's got pull up, if, if, that, if you know what that means. That means a pull up is basically when you pull up on the, you know, push up on the bottom of leather, it gets lighter on the surface because the oil is kind of spread out. This is not goatskin. Okay, so this here, let's get rid of the name. This here is another original jacket from that era, but this is goatskin. Um, they're very similar, but they're different, okay? And um, that's the reason I chose to use that leather instead of goatskin. I wanted to have a little bit of um, oily texture to it like the other one did. So this is the back panel right here. That's the new leather, that's the old leather. Okay, so we're gonna to touch this up a little bit here to kind of blend that in, to try to make it old. Also, we couldn't save the collar. We had to put a new collar. We saved the back piece, and I couldn't use the back piece in the front. It's not how it's done. First of all, it's got snaps in it. The front piece does not. Also, the back piece has a center seam. The front piece does not. So couldn't salvage that it's here somewhere. It was just, just too dry here. It was just too dry and, and I, I couldn't salvage it. So I was going to replace it. And I don't want to replace... I want to salvage as much as I can of the original jacket. Okay? And the areas that I replaced, I had no choice, but I, I had to replace it. Like the shoulder seam, shoulder piece there. So, but we did on both of them. That way, make it look like it's some sort of a pattern. Now, in the, some of the other areas where it was really bad, I reinforced the back with nylon fabric. So, it doesn't look like it's just all pieced up with new leather. I didn't want to do that. Just This would be okay. This will hold for her. And now, basically, we're just going to touch it up a little bit get the color right and this is all the bombs I'm going to mute that down a little bit I didn't want to put all the red in it to kind of jump at you you know because you want it to kind of blend in a little bit not really brand new now this is better than what it was it's still a little bit visible it's not so bright I think uh, I think it'll be nice once it gets done all right let's continue okay now the collar and the pockets have snaps Okay, now originally I replaced the snap with the original type snaps, which are these right here. But these are pretty difficult to snap on and off. So I changed the style to spring snaps. If you look here, see if I can get a little close up here. See those two little lines right there? Those are called, those are called, those are springs. So it's spring snaps. When you push this into that, the mate, it springs right on top of it. This is a lot of easier to put on and off, if I can see what I'm doing. There you go. So as you're snapping on and off, there's not that much stress on the leather. With the other snap, it would have been a lot more stress and it might, you know, a chance of damaging the leather because it's so old. So that's why I chose to put the spring snap on there. Let's continue.
All right, we are getting there, slowly but surely. Now I still have to touch up the color a bit and condition it. So we're getting, we're making progress. I put the plastic cover on the patch so it doesn't get dirty while I'm touching up the color. We don't want to make a mess of it. All right, let's continue. All right, I got a story for you guys. So you guys know how I sharpen my blades, right? And I always uh, couldn't figure out why people were getting triggered by it. You know, I'm like, it's just sharpening my blades. And, and I don't sharpen them to a point where it's so sharp that, you know, I need to use it to cut leather and all that. Majority of the time, it's just to cut stitches to take things apart. So it's just a minor, you know, um, dry sharpening on the stone here, right? So somebody commented on one of the videos in regards to why some people are getting triggered. Said that, his name is David. So David said that, imagine if you, the viewer, had a sharpening business or some sort and is, and is very meticulous how to sharpen the blades, the, the products that they offer to sell. They would do their best on sharpening the blade for their customers or for their projects. So I kind of figured out why they're getting triggered because they're trying to be a perfectionist at sharpening blades. And here I am just, you know, rough sharpening of the, the stupid the disposable blade. So David sent me a, a stone, not a specialist when it comes to sharpening stones. So let me read you the letter he wrote. Dear Steve, I was watching your video on the Chinese iron boot and, and commented on what you said about comments you expected to receive on your knife sharpening techniques. I enjoy your, I enjoyed your reply. Never thought of it like that. That was my comment. Never thought of it like that. It shows that you do listen and care about what people say. So I'm sending you a ceramic stone for you to try out. If it works for you, great. If it doesn't, give it to somebody who will, who will use it. I'll use it, David. The brown colored sided is considered medium fine, while the white side is fine stone. Ceramic stones can be used dry, once the surface becomes saturated with the iron fillings, clean it off with any kitchen type cleanser and green scrub pad. If your knife is really dull, sharpen it with a carbon, carb, carbur, carburetum, what the hell, wait, I guess that's the name of this one, stone that you currently use, and then finish it with a medium stone, or if you want, use the medium stone followed up with the fine side. Once you have it sharp, just keep it that way with a touch up when needed. I sure, I'm sure you know what to do. Good luck with the sharpening and keep up the good work on your videos. You inspire me and others to do the best in whatever we choose to do. Always David. Salinas, California. He's a California boy. All right, so thank you, David. I appreciate it. So now I understand that why some people get triggered, but again, it's not a sharpening to a point where it's razor sharp. It's just sharpening enough to cut the threads as I'm taking items apart. All right, welcome back. We are done with another project. I really enjoyed myself on this one. And I hope you guys enjoyed the backstory on the jacket and the owner. All right, so if you guys like this type of video, hit the subscribe button. That'll help the channel grow a little bit. Thumbs up, comment, share, greatly appreciate it. If you guys have any questions in regards to a job that you have, email me with some pictures and a description of what needs to be done. The email is bedos at yahoo.com. That's B-E-D-O-S at yahoo.com. And we'll see you guys again on the next project. Take care.